New York Giants nip the Yankees and Babe Ruth one nothing to win the World Series. Tulsa race riots, 100 dead and counting. Adolf Hitler, voted as chancellor of the German Nazi party. Albert Einstein wins the Nobel Prize. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is diagnosed with polio. And in local news, the first and only accredited high school is opened in rural Milton County, Georgia. A hundred years. A lot can happen in a hundred years. Wars, inaugurations, discoveries, graduations, marriages, children, and all that make life such a grand journey. The generations of people who have graced the hallways of Milton High School have experienced all those things and much more. Through it all, they knew their high school as more than just a building. It was their other home. While the days of school have hastened by, the strong feelings and vivid memories will always be there. A smile, hug, or tear trapped in time. The old Milton High School was actually constructed in 1921 and the students began there uh, over the winter break. They, they moved into that building. And uh, it was an agrarian community where uh, most of the families uh, farmed for a living. In 1921, Charlie Cobb and Ezra Castleberry began unloading bricks on what was to be the Milton High School construction site. People who lived in town and the students, not having had a school close to them in many, many years, were uh, very excited. When the students reported in 1922 after Christmas, uh, the school had 11 classrooms and it went grades one through 11. Uh, unlike high schools today, they didn't have a 12th grade. Blanche Maddox was one of the original teachers along with Nancy Lee Shell who was the first Milton High School teacher with a college degree. The first graduating class was in 1922 and only had two members. There were two females, Clyde Andrews and Kate Walker. And Clyde was a girl. That was a girl's name in those days. Kate Walker's diploma, which was signed by W.T. Harrison, who was the first principal and superintendent, shows us that the name of the school at that time was Milton County High School. Of course, being in a rural community, um, the school actually did not have uh, any restrooms. You had to use outdoor facilities for your restrooms. Also, modern conveniences such as central heating did not exist. And so there was a potbelly stove in each classroom and students had to bring in wood uh, for the fire in the wintertime in order to keep it warm. Uh, as far as the summertime is concerned, the, it was just, you just were hot. In 1923, Professor Herman C. Cook became the principal and presided over a high school of approximately 56 students. The graduating class of 1923 included Daryl Elizabeth Manning, for historical perspective, Miss Manning was born in April 1906, only 25 months after the first Wright brothers' flight. In 1924, the graduating class had grown to five students. Not common in that era, the boys actually outnumbered the girls. From left to right, we see Ruel Burgess, Sybil Spence, class teacher Miss Wade, Frank Manning, Elizabeth Norman, and Sim Manning. By 1927, the graduating class had increased in size to 20 students, with four times as many girls as boys. One of those young ladies was Florence Gertrude Wood. The boys particularly worked in the fields with their fathers, and, and as a result, the school had more females than males when they first began. The 1931 class continued this trend with twice as many females as males. 
Um, we found a lot of information about the FFA, the Future Farmers of America, and that was a big program at Milton. And one of the kind of highlights, I think, of the FFA was in the 30s, um, the FFA club led by their teacher, Mr. Elkins, Pierce Elkins, um, built with help from the community, um, a log cabin that stayed on the campus for a long time. I helped build a log cabin. We started in 34 and finished it in 1935. I guess there's about 40 or 50 members of FFA. Of course, they all wasn't there at the same time, but we all had a good time working. They cut the logs. A lot of those logs came from down around North Point Mall, and some were cut off of the school property. School, all in front of the school was in pines. I brought them in their own two-horse wagon. One of the members, his daddy had a two-horse wagon. He hauled them from North Point Mall up here, and we uh, skinned them with a drawing knife and got rawest and all on you. Then they cut them to length and notched them on the end. With the Depression still lingering, the boll weevil struck the farms hard and school funding withered. To continue paying the bills, Milton County was annexed into Fulton County, a county less dependent on agriculture. With Fulton County providing 20 to 30 percent of the funding and the rest coming from FDR's Work Progress Administration, significant additions and amenities were added, such as central heat and a cafeteria. During the 30s and 40s, Milton did not have any extracurricular activities. The students went straight home to work in the fields or study by lamplight. As Milton reached its 20th year mark, World War II would affect most of its students and their families. Homecomings, exams, and proms were replaced by boot camps, rationing, and uncertainty, and in some cases, even death. Everyone was required to participate in blackouts. And when the alarms would go off, they would be very loud. And everybody was supposed to turn off their lights, and we had black curtains over the windows so that if we turned on the radio, the lights wouldn't show. And my daddy's job was to go out and be sure that all the neighbors had their lights off. But it was very scary for that loud noise and then to read the newspapers and hear the radio. We used to listen to Gabriel Heater every night <laughs> and hear the news about what was going on in, in the war. During the Great Depression, many male students left school to work on their families' farms. Before they could re-enter Milton, war was at hand, and they wanted to serve their country. One such student was Howard Webb, who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He never finished school, but years later was given an honorary diploma. Isham Oliver Teasley, a graduate of the 1934 class, was a war hero and a man who paid the ultimate price for his country. He flew. Um flying fortress bombers during World War II. He and his crew were on like their 47th mission, I believe. His plane uh, was shot down uh, over Italy uh, in 1944, near the end of the war, I believe. He was only 27 years old when he died. The awards that he won um, include Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal with two oak clusters, European, African, and Middle Eastern Campaign Medal with five bronze stars, American Campaign Medal, and the Presidential Unit Citation. As of the production of this video in September 2021, 98-year-old Harold Stevens from the class of 1940 is considered the oldest living Milton graduate. Like most males of his era, he enlisted when the war came. Harold joined the Marines did basic training in Paris Island, South Carolina, and served in the Pacific. When he returned, he met Peggy Rudisill, who was still in high school at Milton. She graduated and married Harold both in 1946. Harold jokingly tells how soon their first child arrived. Judy was born nine months and one minute past the 
after we were married, married. Mm, and you got started. <laughs> Peggy has been laughing at Harold's jokes for a long time. The happy couple has been married for 75 years. After the war ended, Milton High School, like the rest of America, began to change and grow. But the log cabin continued to play a role in the students' lives. All of our social activities, we uh, used the uh, log cabin at that time. I can remember our first dance was in the log cabin. We didn't have very many boys, and so I think we were all, all the girls worked them to death <laughs> trying to get a dance, at least one dance in <laughs> with each one of them. I was in the first class of the 12th graders at, at Milton High School. Another graduate that year was Mary Sue Nix, a person who would go on to work at Milton for many years. I started Milton High School in 46. I uh, graduated in 1951. I was the first graduating class of 12th grade. I guess I worked for about five principals. But Mr. Hansard, Mr. Victor Hansard, was my favorite, <laughs> always. During Mr. Hansard's tenure at Milton High School, we did become the Eagles. He started the band program, the athletic program. We did become an all-round school. The students loved Mr. Hansard because there was no program before that. And as far as we know, Vic Hansard picked the mascot name, the Eagles, and the colors, red, white, and blue. In 1949, we moved to Alpharetta because that was the first job my father was offered by Principal Vic Hansard at the time to be the first football coach and athletic director at Milton High School. So we moved here when I was four years old. And again, my father was the first athletic director and football coach and girls basketball coach and baseball coach at the time. The only gym that we had though was Eagle Village. And uh, that was where right behind Old City Hall is where they play basketball. And I remember it was real short so you could come across the half court line and shoot the ball just like at the foul line in gyms today. But the first gym was built at the old Milton High School in 1954. Within three years of his arrival, Gus Letches led the 1952 Milton Eagles to the state football championship game. My father, Gus, never cussed. He would say, you know, my grabs, something like that, but he, he never cussed like a lot of these football coaches do now. With a lot on his plate as athletic director for all sports, Coach Letches asked his assistant football coach, Ralph Wilson, to be the head baseball coach. Coach Wilson, with the help of pitching and slugging star, Gene Estes, won the baseball state championship in 1955. Gene was considered the best Milton athlete of the 1950s. He was a dominant running back and upon graduation was offered a full football scholarship to the University of Georgia. Beloved local historian and member of the MHS Hall of Fame, as well as multi-sport star at Milton High School, Connie Mashburn recalls memories of the 1958-59 sports season. It was a great year for athletics for Milton. We were in a region with eight other teams, and that year we won three regional championships out of the four uh, that we participated in. Some of the most fun I had was playing basketball because we had a really good team, and we had a guy named John Nesbitt who was a fantastic shooter. You could count on him for 25 points a game. So we kind of breezed through the region games and the playoffs. And when we got to the state tournament, uh, unfortunately, we lost uh, to the team who wound up winning the, the state championship. 
Milton Sports became a rallying point for the community. Yet despite the best intentions, sometimes things didn't quite work out. Maybe I didn't have too many strength, but I was a decent catcher, and uh, I led the team one year in hitting, but my shortcoming was my arm throwing out people going to second base, and our coach was Mr. Ralph Wilson, and he kept telling me, throw at the pitcher's head. So one day a boy took off from first, and John DeVore was on the mound, and he whirled around to look, and I nailed him right in the back of the head, so Mr. Ralph Wilson never told me that again. <laughs> Connie Mashburn was a decent, respectful student who rarely got in trouble, but... My best friend and I decided that we would skip PE class, and we would go to a stairway that led down to the basement, and uh, we could sit on some of the steps and look out to the field where our classmates were participating in PE. Somehow, somebody saw us, and we were smoking, and we never smoked. We weren't smokers, but we said, well, okay, we got a class, let's do something else crazy. So the coach caught us. We knew he was gonna call us in and uh, we'd have some kind of punishment. And the paddle was big, uh, we had had it before. It was Coach Ralph Wilson who would administer the punishment. So we got a bright idea. We decided that we'd put on sliding pads, turn them around so that they would cover our buttocks. I decided to put on two pair. So we went up to Mr. Wilson's office and sure enough, he got the paddle out. And um, so he, uh, he hit my buddy, John Doris, really, really hard, but it sounded funny. It sounded kind of, it was like a thud. So he said, all right, Doris, I don't know what you got there, but take it off. So Johnny uh, pulled off his sliding pads and, and got uh, hit even harder, and this time with no padding. So it was my time and I leaned over and Mr. Wilson swung the paddle and thud again. So he said, all right, Mashburn, you know, I know what you're doing, so take those pads off. And I did, I took off one pair, I left one pair on. And for some reason, when he paddled me with just one pair of pads on, it didn't make an odd noise. So I got through that, uh, that spanking with uh, very little pain. Homecoming was always a big to-do. Uh, it was the night. Festivities were always on the field. Uh, the court was escorted on by the football players, and there was always the dance afterwards. Um, dances were always fun. We had sock hops, and then we had the formal dances. Uh, proms were a little different than they are now. It was actually held at the school, in the gymnasium, we would lock down the gymnasium for several weeks beforehand so that the junior class could go in and secretly decorate. One year at a formal or semi-formal dance in the auditorium, they actually had a twist, which came in about my junior year in high school. And they did a endurance test as far as the twist goes. And I actually won the dance that night for doing the twist for 55 minutes without stopping. Um, but the music that was playing went from Elvis and Frankie Avalon and Fabian, that era, until when I was coming out of high school was the start of the Beatles era. So you had the stroll, you had the pony, then you went into slower, fast dances that came with the Beatles. Being a high school teacher or coach can often be a thankless job with long hours and low pay. But when students remember for the rest of their lives the positive impact you made, in a sense, you become immortalized. I remember our basketball coach, Carol Beavers, very well. Of all the things that I admire about him was the fact that he cared about the boys' playing skills, but he cared more about what their, their future, and he wanted to point them in uh, the right direction. And uh, he had a big influence on me, uh, and I think a lot of the kids that played for him. Great coach, great guy, 
He was in uh, the Korean War, 51, as a second lieutenant. You can imagine how that, that went. He went on and became principal at Melton, and, and later on he was assistant superintendent of Fulton County Schools. Uh, he was in charge of all the school buildings. Remember Blanche Maddox back in 1921? Well, the students of 1954 not only remembered her, but they also dedicated the yearbook to her. She started the music club in 1926, which was the very first club at the school. Among other subjects, she inspired students in piano and chorus for well over 40 years. In the late 60s and early 70s, a new generation walked the halls of Milton High School. War abroad and unrest at home dominated the news. While heroes were fighting overseas, new heroes taught students at Milton. The performing arts at Milton in the 70s was fantastic. We had uh, the chorus and the band, and I was in both of those. And we had the drama club. We didn't have drama classes like we do now, but they were just amazing classes, especially Leon Cole, my band director. He was my favorite teacher of all time. My husband became band director at Milton High School in 1967. He taught in four elementary schools during the mornings. And so he was at Milton just two periods a day. But he had the marching band, and at that time, they didn't do just one show. They did five shows with different music, different march routines, but they were constantly working. So he was, he was a full-time, he worked a lot of hours on that at home too. Leon cared about people. He just, he found the, the kid in, in the school that needed help the most. And he sought them out, went to Gus Letchis, the principal, and said, who needs my help the most? And then he would get them into the band uh, or drum corps or whatever it was, and they would have something to do, and he would just basically um, give them a purpose in high school, get them out of a, a, a problem situation at home or something like that. And he did things like that way after he retired. Uh, remained friends. I remained friends with him for his and the rest of his life. One such student who needed help was Donald Kell, who through circumstances beyond his control became homeless. As a vulnerable young teen, he would sleep in the press box or on top of the school next to a heat vent. One day came where I was sitting in Mrs. Hook's science class and Mr. Cole, the band director, I knew who he was because I always sat out in the stadium and watched him, but I didn't know he knew who I was. But he came to my science class and he asked for me by name and that kind of threw me off. And he asked Mrs. Hook if, if, if I could be excused for a minute. And then I went out in the hall and talked to him. And when I got out there, Mr. Cole introduced himself and told me that I was gonna be in the band, uh, which was a surprise to me. <laughs> it's, uh, I was, had dreamed of being in the band, but didn't know it was, you know, it was going to happen like that. And he uh, asked me if I wanted to be, and I said, sure. And I, so he uh, took me down to the band room and figured out what instrument I wanted to play. And I remember him saying, you know, I need a baritone sax player. He goes, people just don't like to play that saxophone because it's so big. Well, Mr. Cole told me that I was going to be in the junior varsity band during fifth period, but I was going to be his eight during sixth period which kind of threw me off. I was doing okay in school, but most of the time it was the A students that were going to be the teacher's aide, not, not, not me, you know, but I was. And uh, so uh, I went in and learned how to play the baritone sax during fifth period. During sixth period, I would be copying music for him and, and making sure that everybody had their chairs and, and that kind of thing, and it kept me busy. And Mr. Cole and I, we really built a friendship during that period of time. He, uh, he, he really took care of me. Uh, he, a lot of Mr. Cole has just recently passed away. He, uh, he holds a special place in my heart. He, he always will. I think I, I noticed 
that children were different when they came out than when they came in in the drama department. Greg Poulos was the director. He had a huge personality, I mean, just huge. And he would know that kids needed to feel better about themselves, so he would make roles for kids. Whether he, he'd write something new into the script just so they'd have a walk on, and their moms and their grandmas would come. When I was with Greg Poulos, we did many plays, but the ones that are so memorable to me, they, they involved hundreds of students. Just as I had mentioned, he would find a place for people. And we knew in this colorful program of The Wizard of Oz, we had the tin man in a tin suit, tin looking suit, and we had the lion, and we had um, the scarecrow, and uh, we flew the evil witch across the, the gym on a cable, and uh, it, was, it was just a wonderful performance. It ran three nights, which, which is long for a production. We ran Greece two different times in the history of the school. Ross Friedman is one of the teachers that comes to mind that students really loved, and a part of the reason for it was he referred to all of his students as scholars. Ross Friedman had the unique ability to make studying Shakespearean literature fun, no matter what level they were. By calling all his students scholars, he created an atmosphere in which each student took pride in pursuing excellence. The plays we read, whether it was Hamlet or King Lear or Othello, we took parts, people wore, I had costumes all over the room. People would bring in old prom dresses and uh, cloaks and hats and uh, swords and, and everybody got a chance to get up and do something and that they didn't know they could do before and we had a good time. The students seemed to really enjoy the school. The teachers enjoyed being there. And when I became a principal uh, at Milton, I decided that was, that was what I needed to do, was to, to be a principal that m made the school or had a school where everyone that came through the door in the morning were happy to be there. Students, teachers, cafeteria workers, everyone seemed to enjoy working there. Milton was always an integral part of the community, and a, a good example of that is the fact that several of the Milton graduates went on to be mayor of Alvaretta. The first example of this was Sim Manning. Remember Sim from the class of 1924? Also, George Willis Sr. from the class of 1938, Jimmy Phillips from the class of 1967, and... Arthur Letchis is one that comes to mind, and also uh, Chuck Martin, and I taught Chuck Chuck played football, but he was also very active in politics and still is today. Charles E. Chuck Martin Jr. is a 1979 graduate of Milton High School. While a student at Milton, he was involved all four years in student government, serving as student council co-president his senior year, and was also a member of both the Beta Club and the National Honor Society. He was a four-year letterman in baseball, a three-year letterman in football, and a two-year letterman in wrestling. He was also a member of the 1978 Milton High School Wrestling State Championship team. Representative Martin was inducted into our Milton High School Hall of Fame in 2016. The class of 2021, Milton's 100th graduating class, is proud to welcome back a member of our Milton High School family, to the Milton High School 100th Commencement Exercises, Representative Chuck Martin. A little about Milton. My senior year in 1979, I had always had on my mind to, to go to Milton High School. It was the hub of Alpharetta then, really all of North Fulton, anything above Roswell. The Milton student body was made up of areas that now include Northview, Johns Creek, Alpharetta, Cambridge and the current Milton High School. Imagine that, all of those students, all of that land area came to one school. We, we were one school and one family then as you are today, and I love my time at Milton. So Milton was a different place, but as I walked in here tonight, I feel the same thing from you all that I felt 42 years ago when I sat where you're sitting. You know, when Milton moved into the new building um, over in what is now Milton City, right? 
I wrote in the football program a letter in part, Milton is more than just a building. It's a tradition and it grows stronger every year with every student and every new class. Nancy Strada was a wonderful attendance office. She was so tough, but she loved those children. She kept track of them. They didn't divert too much from good behavior when she was around because the consequences would be there. She was just great at her job. For 15 years, Nancy was a tough but respected gatekeeper at Milton High School. Yet she was loved because the students knew she cared. She was also famous for attending countless different Milton sporting events. Well, the softball team and the soccer were by far my favorite teams. And the girls' softball was just always very welcoming. And the players, even the parents, would thank me for coming to their, to their event. And uh, soccer, they just, I mean, I love soccer, so both of, I'd go for both guys and gals because the girls would play first and then the girls varsity and then the boys varsity. And lacrosse, I'd go to lacrosse. That, I never did quite understand that sport, but it was fun to watch. You know, even now, if you see a child or see one of those students that's grown up, they'll still say, I remember you would come to my games, so, you know. Over the years that I was there, I'd have, you know, friends and people say, how can you work at a high school with high school kids? And they didn't realize, I mean, they really, I mean, they're, you know, they're young adults and they're, they, they were amazing. You know, they would always say hi to you no matter where you were. And um, a few years ago when they tore down the uh, old Milton, there was a day that you could go and go through the halls. And so there would be, a, there was a lot of former students there. And I had my pic, you know, they'd want to have a picture taken even then, you know, and they'd be holding their kids and, and you'd be there with them. And, uh, you know, you just know that you, I don't want to say made a difference, but an impression on, on them as they did on me. Former Chicago Cubs second baseman and Milton High graduate, as well as Milton Hall of Fame member, Bobby Scales is the epitome of determination and resilience. Bobby had to fight his whole baseball career for the opportunity to play. The day I made my debut with Chicago Cubs, May 5th, 2009, if I had one word to describe it, I would have to say validation. Um, I was good enough. I knew I was good enough. Sometimes opportunities in life don't come necessarily uh, when you want them. They come when they're supposed to. And so, um, you know, it, it was validation of all the things I had gone through prior to that. Ten years in the minor leagues, and having to walk on at the University of Michigan, uh, having to fight and scrap to get on my high school team. While Bobby faced some challenges at Milton, mostly he had positive memories and fond recollections. How does excellence begin? It begins with people. And I think that for me... Uh, my most cherished memory about Milton are the people. Uh, Lydia Sadu, Sharon Shermer, my Spanish teachers, uh, mi maestras de español, uh, dos mujeres muy importantes a mí, very, two women very important in my development and my, uh, my learning of the Spanish language and culture. La señora Sadu, she made us respect Spanish and the language and the accent. She's like, no acento tan flojos, no, no, no lazy accents. She would have us say the same word over and over again in the class period. I'm really fortunate to have been part of the inaugural class of the Milton High School Hall of Fame in 2016. Other notable alumni not previously mentioned are...
Milton has a rich sports tradition, which includes many state champions, as well as the most dominant girls lacrosse program in Georgia. At the end of our first hundred years, students everywhere were confronted with an unseen enemy that stole days away from school. There was no more laughing with classmates, homecomings, or studying with friends. My planned retirement happened by coincidence during COVID. Um, and that last semester, my students were gone. I think it was March 12th. We didn't know that we wouldn't be back. Um, and I have always taught seniors. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to them. I mean, we had these computer classes, um, and we weren't really, I didn't really even get to see all of them on computer or anything like that. And it was heartbreaking, honestly. It was, it was heartbreaking for the students as well. Those students, those seniors, they, they had to graduate. We had a video graduation. They didn't even get to get back together for their graduation. They didn't get to say really a, a goodbye to their school, at their school. I didn't get to say goodbye to my own students. And that's something that I won't forget. During the first 70 years of Milton High School, it was the norm for multiple generations of the same family to attend Milton High School. But in today's hypermobile society, it is a rarity. When my dad was in high school, he performed at Milton in the band and theater and all of it. And now that I'm doing the same thing, I feel like he's really proud. And I feel honored that I can do the same thing as him and it's really special and my brother did the same thing as him and we all just share the same passion of music and performing. I would have never thought that I would have had a family and children that went to Milton and did so well. I'm very proud of my kids. My Harrison went to Milton High School. He made the highest SAT score in his class. He's the only male that got the Schuler's Award and went to uh, New York City, best leading actor in a musical in Georgia. Sarah was on Broadway as a lead actress in a musical when she was 11. And she's been the lead in a number of Milton High School plays as well. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy 100th Milton High School. Happy birthday to you. It was a happy existence. I, I fell into it. I didn't know, I didn't plan to be a teacher. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I would be a sports announcer at some time. I fell into this career. Um, and it was, Joseph Campbell says, when, when you allow the invisible hands to move you, then you'll, you'll wind up following your bliss. And it, it worked. I've had a happy life. Milton will go down and Leon Cole will go down uh, having influenced not just me, but my children and my children's children. And that's what it's about. Uh, I hope that my grandchildren can take my stories and take my children's stories of Milton and make them real and bring them the same kind of power and joy that it brought me. Milton means a lot to me because I basically spent almost my entire career at Milton. I started at the old building. I, I finished up last year in the new building and I count so many of my former students as my, my friends and family, and my, my life has been so enriched by the students that I've taught. Um, and I can't imagine that not having been part of my life. For each student, past, present, and future, there will come a day in which we no longer walk the halls of Milton High School. 
but part of our soul will always be there, learning, cheering, and loving one another in our own way and time. And what a grand time it was. Thank you, Milton High School, for a hundred years of excellence. We can't wait to see what the next hundred years has to offer. We can't 